So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, uh, our speaker in the informatics and uh, department and Institute for Software Research uh, uh, seminar uh, series is uh, Judith Bishop, who's director of computer science at uh, Microsoft Research Connections in Redmond. Uh, she's been at Microsoft for seven years. Prior to that, she was a uh, academic. Uh, her areas of interest include uh, all aspects of software, programming languages, and related uh, tools and techniques. And today, she's going to speak to us about uh, open source software and industry and talk about some of what Microsoft Research is interested in doing and working on in this area. So uh, let me introduce uh, Judith to you. Thanks very much, Walt. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. It's my first time uh, this far south of um, in California. I think I did come to Disneyland long, long, long ago, but uh, um, this is this is really great. I hear it's the billionaire capital of uh, the West, and I'm happy. <laughs> Maybe I'll come back when I'm a billionaire. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, open source is uh, a huge area to talk about. Funnily enough, these days they're not conferences about open source because it's so pervasive. It's in everything we do. And you'll find papers on open source at almost every conference. Uh, people are trying to explain why it becomes so important in their particular area. So this talk is, what, what about industry? Of course, we've heard about different industries have always had open source, and other industries, perhaps like Microsoft, have moved into open source. And let's talk about some of the challenges, some of the successes, and some of the statistics that are involved in that. I'm going to just have a few slides about what is open source first, and then what is open source in general in Microsoft, and then in particular my speciality, which is the open source projects inside Microsoft Research. So open source software, there are a lot of uh, myths about it. You might have heard of these, uh, that it means public domain software. Well, it doesn't. Um, that it's free. It's not always free. Uh, as we well know, projects like Red Hat and so on are open source, but they are sold under a license and a service agreement, which generates a great deal of revenue. So software can be open source, but still generating revenue. Um, and it's not enforced by anyone. In other words, it's just an open field out there, and anyone can go and play. That's uh, not always the case at all. In fact, it's probably uh, safer to say uh, one of the two following things. First of all, that open source is a licensing model. So this is a real legalistic way of looking at open source. But let's explore it just a minute. So it's a license approved by the Open Source Initiative. The Open Source Initiative exists, and it has many licenses. Uh, 20 or so different licenses are there. <laughs> Uh, some of them are much more popular than others. Um, but it boils down to the following, that it is the right to copy, modify, and redistribute the code at different levels depending on the license. However, it gives no representations or warranties. Now, actually, if you look up on a search engine that term, you will find that it's a legal term. No rep or warranty. Uh, and you get that when you sell secondhand goods or so on. If you sell your couch to somebody, uh, to your student friend, you sell it without reps or warranties. All right, so that's kind of what open source is, is doing. And on the other hand, redistribution triggers certain licensing obligations on you. 
So if you redistribute the code, you are required to include, for example, the original license that came with that code. So there is an enormous amount that one has to know, and generally you have some kind of licensing team behind you when you do open source licensing. Certainly in Microsoft we do. We have a, a team of licenses who look after this for us so that we don't um, understep or overstep any marks. Um, and I don't want to spend any more time on licensing. It's not really an interesting topic. One just has to be aware of it. Much more fun much more fun, is open source is a development methodology. Right. Now, this is where people really feel comfortable and at home. This is where you can say, OK, now I recognize open source. It's where we have users as developers. In other words, people come in there, they find that something's not quite right, so they uh, either fix it or they send in bug reports and they get involved. It's a very involved community. It starts off with early release of the software. So this is the antithesis of what uh, the big corporations used to do, where, the, for example, Windows used to have three-year um, cycles. When you would release a, a, a software and then you embark upon or you might have started on the next one already, but you would embark upon a three-year cycle to get the next one ready. Open source is very different. You go for an early release. Why? Because your users as the developers are going to help you out to make that thing better. Of course, it requires a great deal of trust and a great deal of uh, courage to do this. And corporations have not always been in that mindset. Frequent integration, obviously, if code is, if suggestions are coming in, you've got to be ready and waiting to put those in if they're the good ones. You have several versions of the code running all at the same time, one of which is the one which is out there, and the others are the ones that you're checking around it all the time. So there's um, a very different way of handling um, the software. It's not the same as it was when you were doing things. Very high modularity is important. High modularity is because hopefully people are going to touch uh, parts of the code and not go all over. And that will enable you to do this um, integration on a modular basis. So if you do have open source, high modularity is a good thing. Now, dynamic decision making, haha. <laughs> if you have your users as developers and you are changing requirements or changing the, um, even the objectives of the software as you go along based on what users are actually thinking and saying about you, then you do need to have a decision making process which is going to be reactive to that. And this would not have been the case in the old software model. Now, I'm not talking about software models like Waterfall versus Agile. I'm talking more at the organizational level. So these are things which uh, might have been a bit scary for companies, but which they have acknowledged are now what they do need to do. Now, when I think of open source myself, so I drew this picture and it's how I see the world, it's quite simple. Um, there's three types of people in the open source community. There are those who make the software originally. People who had the idea and the project, they call the creators. The people who use it and the people who contribute back. Now, users <coughs> can also be contributors. These roles are not mutually exclusive, but these are the roles. Now, industrial companies can engage in all of these. So this is the change that has happened, for example, in <coughs> Microsoft over, the, over a period of time. That prior to that, they just had creators and users of their software. And now, 
they do all three actions. Let's go through them. They create and they put the software out as open source, which means it goes into one of the typical repositories. And by the way, Microsoft is now putting most of its software on GitHub um, in order to have it all in one place. They previously had a couple of other repositories, but now it's mainly in GitHub. Um, secondly, coming back, you can use open source so software in anything inside Microsoft under license. This was not the case previously. It was almost forbidden that you would use open source software because there was a fear that you would taint, you would taint in some way your software. Now, of course, there still is that problem, but it can be controlled and it's not forbidden and it's not discouraged in a great way. And thirdly, people with inside an industrial company can contribute as part of their daily work, as part of their work time to open source software. Now, you might hear things like at um, Google, uh, people are allowed to spend 20% of their time with some figure like that contributing to open source software. Now, we don't have uh, figures like that at Microsoft because it all depends who you are. Uh, some people spend a lot of time contributing to open source software if they are on projects where the open source um, component of what they're doing is highly important. Um, we also have people who serve other roles inside the open source community, such as um, within foundations and so on. Uh, the head of the Apache Open Source Foundation, um, the president is um, uh, an employee of Microsoft, and he has been the president of that uh, for 15 years now. So that those kind of roles are very, very important inside the community. Now, what are the wins? So before, before we go through that, I, I was talking earlier to some students about this. You know, what actually makes a company take that leap into open source when you've previously perhaps said, I'm not going to do it. We're not going to do open source. And there isn't really one reason, but possibly the one you can point at the most is we might lose money. If we give away our software, which is earning money, uh, and now it's out there for free, we'll lose money. So uh, why would we do that? Stupid, stupid idea. We're not going to do that, right? So now when you're doing it, and then you go and look at the books at the end of three months, so are we losing money? And no, we're not losing money. OK, what happened? We're earning money in other ways. And I'll discuss that when it comes, but actually you're not losing money by putting things out because one of the factors is that if you are within the open source community, <coughs> you are using other people's software. So you can reduce your time to market by not having your people write uh, code which might not be your core business. If it's your core business to do um, biomedical um, software, let's say, that's your, your company, you don't want to be writing user interface software. You can get that as open source and integrate it with what you've got. So you can reduce your time to market, and that's what companies have, su su have finally realized. You can have improved products through community collaboration. You can also take long-standing, really risk-free software from the community uh, that has been out there for a very long time. It's robust. You can have interoperability, so you can get growth. Interoperability is very important and is slightly even different to um, open source in that supposing Microsoft software runs on Windows, but they want to have versions for other platforms, for, for Mac and so on. They can use underlying um, standards and so on, which come in, and they can build on top of that. Uh, 
other software which encourages interoperability like Node.js, um, Docker, these kind of softwares, they can bring them in and then build on top. And innovation is very important. One thing I haven't put here, but I do want to add it, is that um, the perception outside in the market of your company goes up if you are encouraging open source. And the example I like to give is it's a little bit like organic vegetables in a, in a grocery. Um, they look, they have this aura around them. It's very hard to define it, but you go in there and you'll sort of take the organic ones because you think they're good. And a lot of people go for the open source because they think it's good, right? Because it's community and so on. But they might not actually dig into it as far as open sourcing is concerned, but it has a good aura. So let's look at the different industries out there, and I'm uh, focusing on the main tech industries here. But IBM, Infosys, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook, everybody has got major open source investments. If you type in company X open source, you will get a list of stuff. And that's what I did. And as you can see, um, the different companies have different things. Uh, to be fair, Apple's, open, Apple's um, offerings are there, but they do tend to be a little bit more difficult um, to access, although, although they are. And Google's are very easy um, to go with. They've, they've had a very open policy for a long time. Um, Microsoft is new to market, but they, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about what they have. But they're not the only players. Other medium-sized and very important companies, such as the one I've mentioned there, Verizon, you know, they're the, and um, EMC, the data, data warehousing company, all of these, they're all putting their stuff out as open source as well. And that's a change, um, very important. At this point, I'd like to mention that there is a part of industry, which steadfast, a couple of parts actually, which steadfastly don't go open source. So I've heard this from them. Uh, the one is the accounting industry. Um, they just feel that all the benefits of open source would lay them open to too much openness. <laughs> Shall I put it that way? They like to keep things a little bit closer to their chest and they don't believe that the... Uh, so there are art articles out there in the, in the press where people from the major accounting industries um, have been interviewed, SAP and so on, and they say they're just not going that route for most of their software. Uh, the other one is um, <laughs> the motor car industry. Uh, you can imagine that the, the software that's going to run on your motor car, they have such a liability for that because of the human um, responsibility for human life. And so for some reason, certainly in Europe, I'm not so sure about what the case is here. Maybe we can discuss it afterwards. Um, they, won't, they won't open source their software. They must write it all themselves. It's a requirement, Daimler-Benz and so on. All right, that's done. So you can't unfortunately read this slide, which I got from our people over in the, in the product groups. But this shows that it didn't happen over one year at Microsoft, it happened over a period of time that little things crept in. Um, as you can see right in the middle there, a little penguin, and that was the first time when Linux started to run on Microsoft software, um, followed quite soon afterwards by Node.js, and then we had the .NET Foundation founded right up near the end there. 
And now finally it says that we have 1,600 open source projects on code, Plex, and GitHub. So these are individual projects uh, which are available and manned and curated and there are people behind them who are monitoring them and answering questions. That of course being a very important factor. There's another one there, Hadoop, which is very important for Microsoft because of the whole cloud aspect. So I'm going to mention just one of the tools to give you an idea as to how these integrate into what a huge company does. So one of the big revenue streams for Microsoft is their uh, VM, uh, sorry, the, the development environment called Visual Studio. So Visual Studio is sold. There is a code edition which is available to students for free, but generally speaking, it's, it's sold. Now, inside of that, there is Python tools, and Python tools is completely open sourced. And so it is inside Visual Studio, but open sourced, whereas Visual Studio itself is not open sourced. And in addition, to illustrate how Visual Studio itself incorporates open source, if you look at the license that is included when you get Visual Studio, there are 150 additional licenses to open source software. So the world has certainly changed. Right? So over the years, um, there have been 150 little modules and or big modules which have moved in. Right. Um, here's one, how does uh, Microsoft actually make its money now with this, with this kind of thing? And it's through the cloud. So what they do, what we do, is we leverage the Azure cloud and we put up virtual machines and inside there corporations can run anything they like. And of course, they play f pay for the cloud services. Now, the fact that they can now run more services inside the cloud, which previously they couldn't, makes the cloud more attractive and there is more going on. <coughs> I just saw this one, which was launched last week. Windows SDK for Facebook. Right? That's one of the things which now runs really nicely. And here is just a montage of all the kinds of um, uh, systems that you can get inside of Azure. As you can see, there's Docker and Eclipse and stuff that you might well recognize, Java and so on. However, my main uh, focus is my initiative that I'm running here at, at um, Microsoft Research. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to get the fantastic software, which over the past two years has been open sourced by Microsoft researchers, and get it out more widely than just having it talked about at conferences. And the way I'm doing that is I've got 50 projects now, but they're coming out monthly. Every month we get another list of projects. Um, they're aimed at the academia, developers, and obviously back internally at our own products. I'm trying to get them out to our users. The problem has been for individual uh, researchers at the, is that the potential users that they want can't find their products. <coughs> Why is that? I don't know how many of you have actually tried to find stuff on GitHub, but it's very hard to find unless you know what you want. Right? Everything on there has got a code name. It might or might not be grouped. It's generally not. It's just under some individual's name. And it's very hard to browse. Actually, browsing is not something that GitHub's famous for. So we've set up a portal, which I'm going to show you. And then difficulty actually accessing the code. 
we've been moving everything to GitHub, and the idea there is that people will have some idea of uniformity, and they will get to know that system a lot better. And we work very closely with the people at GitHub, and we are uh, giving them new ideas, and they give us ideas, and so on. So this is what I did, is I established these categories. They're not cast in stone, but for six months they have sort of been quite stable. 12 categories um, of projects. So from verification all the way down to society. And the tools were the, are then classified into these um, categories. And researchers are asked a single question. Are you prepared to um, advertise and interact with academics? Yes, no. Because if they aren't, we don't want to advertise the project because then they don't, they're not going to be able to answer questions and so on. And 90% do want to, and they want to grow their communities, and they want to talk to people, so then they're up and on the, on the portal. And this is what the portal looks like, and there were some flyers outside, you can have a little bit more. Um, I can't show you the whole of it, and I'm not logged on here. So what you end up having underneath the pretty beginning of it is a list of all the projects. And each of those links there takes you to what's called a project page, where the project is described. It doesn't take you to GitHub. It takes you to a project page, which gives the publications, the people, um, videos, tutorials, and so on, about that project. From there, you go to the code at GitHub. Sometimes those two are on GitHub, in which case you do go immediately to GitHub, but most of the time not. So there usually is what's called a project page, and you go there, get lots of information, and then move off. And the name of the portal is research Microsoft com slash open source. It's a long handle, but I'm sticking with it. I, I quite like it. Um, tells you exactly where it is and what it is. And that's the, the thing. So I want to spend our time together going through some of the projects there. And then with each of these projects, I'm going to pull out some important um, criteria and characteristics, which at the end we'll summarize to say, this is really what research projects need. And I'll propose those to you and we can perhaps discuss them a little bit more. So these are all different, these projects. I've chosen them because they're different. The first one is called Code Contracts for .NET. Now, Code Contracts has been around for quite a long time. It's um, done with Mike Barnett and his students and his interns and colleagues. And it's a um, language agnostic way for expressing coding assumptions, pre and post conditions, stuff like that. Um, it has a very active development community. As you can see here, what I've pulled from GitHub is the contributions Okay, which were heading up to around 40 around July and sort of tailing off a bit. Of course, these include contributions from Mike and his team themselves, but there are other people as well. Um, what is important is that the source code for code contract tools is actually inside .NET. So .NET is part of what um, supports Windows. And if you get it, you get the source code for code contracts. Right? You don't get the source code for the whole of .NET, but code contracts is one of the things you do get the source code for. So it's a bit of a patchwork. And it's been shipped with .NET since last July, which is probably why we saw that big spike. So people were sending in bugs and things like that. The second one is Daphne. Who knows Daphne? Anybody here? All right, Daphne is a programming language with a verifier built in, uh, done by Rustin Lino. 
Um, this one has not moved to GitHub yet. It's still on another repository called CodePlex. Um, what Briston's also done is he's created the system on five different platforms. So you can get it on um, Apple, you can get it on Windows, you can get it on different versions of Windows, you can get it on um, Android and so on. And it also runs in the browser. So you can run it without even downloading it. And that's a very important aspect of what we've been doing over the past five years before the whole open source movement is we've put some of these tools up on browsers so that people could use them independently of downloading them. Now on CodePlex, what we've got here is the number of downloads of the system. And so you can see that this is other statistics. This is from December through to January, uh, end of January when I took the um, thing. And the number is right at the top here is 40. So this is daily downloads. So there was quite a, a spike around about middle of January when a lot of people were downloading. What you're beginning to see here is we're not talking about thousands. Right? We're not talking about tens of thousands, which might be what we're doing with Windows and so on. These are research projects, but they are of interest. The other picture over there is Daphne running on the browser. So you can just run it on the browser and you can hit, thing, hit um, buttons and so on, and everything happens. And then when you're ready to download, you can download it. The next one is Touch Develop. Now, Touch Develop is a language and environment for creating apps on, on mobile phones originally. But it's spread so that you can create apps on anything, and now also on these tiny little microbit computers. Um, and it's all led by Tom Ball. What was interesting about this one was that originally we weren't going to open source it at all. But we were forced to open source it by Hour of Code, which was this movement that everybody, uh, all children, should um, spend an hour coding, mainly. And President Obama also apparently spent a few minutes coding. Um, but they said if you wanted to be on the Hour of Code website, your software had to be open source. So that was a bit of a shock at that time. And then we realized, well, it didn't really matter. We could just open source. Now it runs on any device, and it runs on the browser. So not only does it run on any device, and I'm talking every single um, <coughs> Apple phone, every single Android phone, Windows phone, whatever, um, iPads, you name it. You can imagine we've actually got full-time people making sure this happens. Um, it also has inside of itself its own repository for all the apps that people create. It's called the Bazaar. So you can, and there's 308,000 scripts already in there. And those are all open sourced as well among themselves. So the model was always like that, that you would share. So you can share one of those, add to it, change its name, and create it. Of course, the history of that thing is still there, but you've got the new one. And what we've got here is the number of commits over time. So you can see they're heading up to 100, and these are uh, daily, <coughs> daily commits uh, at a time. You can see it's starred. These are other kind of statistics you get out of GitHub. So over a thousand stars, that means people who like it. 157 forks, that's another statistic. And 115 people watching the project. So this is quite a busy project, actually. Probably not many of you have heard of Project Orleans, but you might have heard of Halo, the game. Have you? Uh, Halo, the, the sort of shoot or duck game that runs on Xbox. Well, it's all running on top of Orleans. So Orleans is a virtual abstraction 
um, for distributed applications. It was invented by Phil Bernstein, who's one of our brightest distinguished scientists at Microsoft. And um, it's, it's organized so that everything that you have is deployed automatically in the cloud. And that's how Halo runs. But it's got to be fast. It's got to be up, down, down, up, down. And it's streaming all the time uh, and interactive and so on. So audience is part of the major revenue base for Microsoft. So Halo is sold. We get a lot of money from Halo, but part of it is open sourced. Right. No problem. That's how it is. It also runs um, with 343 other industries that are in a similar game as that. And you can see that there are people from all over the world. This is another graph you get from uh, GitHub, it tells you and shows you the photos of the contributors and how many commits and so on they have done uh, in a, a certain, uh, in a week. So what it's saying there is that excluding mergers, 11 authors have posted, have pushed 13 commits to the master and 45 commits to all branches, etc., etc. So it's an active project. Um, and people are helping to make it better. Uh, the team for that one, by the way, is two people and Phil. That's all at Microsoft, only two people. They're two extremely bright people, and they work extremely hard. But um, the rest is all the open source community. OK, the different thing with F sharp and try F sharp. F sharp is a language which is a functional version of C sharp which started about 10 years ago and has some really interesting features like type providers and uh, units of measure and so on. It's mature, open source, cross-platform, functional first, run by Don Sun in our Cambridge lab. So it's always been open source from the beginning. So that's a bit different to some of the others that started off and then became open source. This one started open source. And a while back, we wanted to make it into a browser version. And we did this version called Try F Sharp, which runs in browsers. And interestingly enough, that one is not open source. And that has caused us <coughs> some considerable difficulty, because we're now in a situation where it needs to be extended and we don't have a team to do it anymore. So here you have a problem. If we had open sourced it originally, we might well have people out there who would have been able to help us. Now, F-Sharp itself moved off from Microsoft about um, a couple of years ago to a foundation called the F-Sharp Software Foundation. It's based in London. And it's vibrant. If you go to their page, you'll find all sorts of projects people are doing, um, uh, activities, events, and so on. It's a super foundation. And they also run all the open source there, and it's on GitHub. So I just point, printed out here a couple of the community projects that are being done by people within the foundation. So foundations are an integral part of the whole open source movement. And all the industrial companies, including Microsoft, belong to many of them because they foster um, just keeping things in order a little bit. And they enable people to get together on neutral ground to agree on which way a certain project might go. And they foster standards as well. The foundations are good. Madoko. Who's heard of Madoko? I know somebody has. Right. Madoko is a fantastic markdown processor. It's my second highest um, used project. Right. Uh, so if a lot of people use it, uh, I think you might need to take a look at it. It's sort of LaTeX on steroids. Um, because it enables you to ha do everything in the cloud, 
and it's marked down, so not just LaTeX, and it has um, um, multi-person, multi-person working as well. All right. So it runs multi-platform and browser. You can download it to your machine, or you can run it in the browser, both. And you can sh use Dropbox or GitHub or Azure as your cloud. And it's very open to extension. And in fact, the person running this, Don Layen, is very keen that you should uh, add extensions. Over two weeks, this is just the recent stats. I asked Don for these stats last week. It had 2,000 new users, 1,500 unique uh, pages, visits, and 1,500 downloads um, in the past month. So the question here is, does openness increase attractiveness? Was Madoko attractive because it was open? I thought I'd just throw in that question right now. Because the next one, which I'm putting in, is not open source at all. So you might say, well, why am I putting this one in? Well, it happens to be a project I'm running, and it has some aspects of openness, but not open source. So Microsoft is um, building quantum computers down in Santa Barbara. That's no secret. But in order to uh, ramp up people who are able to program quantum computers, we've built a simulator, a software simulator. It's called Liquid, spelt in a very funny way. Um, so the Liquid simulator is there. And the simulator is online. And you can download it, and you can run it. The simulator is not open source. But all the code, which is input to the simulator, is. So that's how we kind of get around that a little bit. Um, and now I just want to tell you that we've had enormous success with the simulator, up to 16,000 users in December from all over the world. That's a country uh, dial there, mainly from the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, France, Germany, and other. Uh, the usual suspects, but um, we have a challenge going at the moment. So you can go to Quantum Challenge on researchmicrosoft.com and there are huge prizes for uh, writing programs on the simulator if you have any interest whatsoever in quantum computing. It's still worth going to have a look at. And this is my last one. We had a very big project called Worldwide Telescope. Now, Worldwide Telescope was, or is, this huge project, which it's like um, uh, Google Maps, but it looks upwards at the sky. And it's used by NASA, uh, supported by them for all sorts of uh, uh, exp explorations on the sky. One of the most recent things was um, the discovery of Planet Nine. So that's a simulation from um, a Worldwide Telescope uh, of Planet Nine, which is 5,000 bigger than poor old Pluto, which is no longer a planet, um, looking at, this, at the sun, which is over there. Uh, so it's very far away, Planet Nine. And what happened was we ran out of people to look after this. This happens with open source projects. Now, what do you do when this happens? <coughs> well, you can just sort of say, oh, well, sorry. Well, you annoy a lot of users. Uh, for a university to annoy a lot of users might not be um, as embarrassing as it is for a company to annoy a lot of users, because it reflects very badly on you. They see it as the company get, letting them down. So we had to do something. So we did three things. First of all, we moved the whole system to the cloud, to Azure. It was sitting on a server in somebody's office. Moved it up to Azure, and we paid for that to happen. And we paid for the Azure time, and for somebody to be an advisor on the whole thing. And then we touted around, and we got the American Astronomical Society to look after it. So they're now going to be the foundation 
essentially, which will look after World Dry Telescope. So they see this as an advantage to them. So what did we learn from that? There we go. Just a summary of some of the things. Right in the middle is its communities of developers. You can have external push that make you go open, like with Touch Develop. You can ship with other major products. We've seen several examples of that. Timing is less th important than having support. So you can open source at any phase in the project. But you've got to keep in mind that you do need to support it whenever you do. You do need versions for all, all platforms, even though you might op open source. Or it's advantageous that you do. It's not that you need to. Um, foundations and associations are a great thing. And a single repo focuses um, expertise, as we are with uh, GitHub. Here are some foundations that uh, we're members of and that other companies are also members of. It was interesting to look up the dates of these and to find that, in fact, the Python Software Foundation is the oldest one of the language ones. I thought they were newer, but no, they've been there a while. And on the .NET Foundation, which was spawned from Microsoft, but it's used by many uh, companies, uh, there's a lot of stuff. So, what are we doing about it, myself? I want to get more of you using our fantastic tools that I've been telling you about, all 50 of them and more. And so we've got this uh, open source challenge, right? If you go out and use one of these tools and submit a report about what you did by April, then you can win big prizes, $5,000 first prize, lots of second prizes. We will also be inviting people for interviews for internships and to visit Microsoft for hackathons and so on. So there's the URL. It's a shorter one this time. aka.ms slash open source challenge. And if you go there, there's everything. You can register immediately for the challenge. Tell us what you're going to do, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Minutes for questions for Judith. And now, cyber security is a critical topic. Yes. And for open community <coughs> OSS, yep. how we can protect our security, especially for aerospace or our European or the military or our military. Or our military. Did you mention aerospace? Yes. Yeah. Aerospace or medical or critical. Okay, so I did mention earlier that that some of the car um, that car manufacturers do not want to open source their software, but um, this is not a universal uh, thing. Uh, one of the projects we have that is open sourced, which is very interesting, under um, cryptography, you can see there's a whole section here on cryptography is the TPM software stack library. Now, TPM is the chip which is inside computers. Yeah. And the code for the cryptography for that is open source. Because we are so sure that it's all based on the keys anyway, the code doesn't matter, right? Um, so that's for uh, cryptography. There's a lot more involved in cyber security uh, and so on. And this is a call that has to be made on a case-by-case -case basis, I think. Thank you very much. All right. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Joon Che from the Seoul Korea with my students here. Yeah. Uh, there are many uh, open source uh, tools, software. So uh, as an undergraduate student, to what extent they should know about the open source tools, do you think? Maybe uh, the more, the better, right? <laughs> um, I think it's, you know, using tools that are open source is the beginning. 
it's quite likely that you might not reach the point where you contribute to those tools, either because it's too difficult, you know, the underlying um, knowledge required to get up to speed with that tool might be uh, beyond you. You haven't learned about it. And these tools on artificial intelligence, for example, require a, some of them quite a, a lot of um, study of artificial intelligence before you can use them. But by starting with the open source tools, you give yourself the option of going in there and looking at the code and contributing. And once you even look at the code, you will then be able to write better code yourself. And I think that's probably one of the really magnificent things about open source software, that you can look at the code and say, oh, that's how it's done. I can do that too now. Obviously, people then go and steal the code and, and put it in their own software, but that's okay. You've got to attribute it. Um, maybe people don't realize that, but they do, sh they do, and they should. Other questions? <coughs> so I have a question. Sure. Um, so uh, how can, uh, are there lessons learned in your opinion, from Microsoft research that might also be adopted by the Microsoft product groups with regard to uh, open source, or are those worlds very different and not comparable? Um, I think the second is uh, Im important. Microsoft research is more like a university in that most of these projects here are single person projects. Um, four is a big number for a project here. Yeah. Right. They're mostly just individuals who have had this fantastic thing and they're putting it out there. And they're prepared to work on it and, and curate it for as long as they, they can. Very different in the product groups if you're looking at um, these, these kinds of ones, well, these are use of projects. But if you're looking at, let's go to this. I mean, this would have hundreds of people involved. Who, and they would be on duty 24 hours a day, round the clock in different regions of the world, making sure that everything is going well. Uh, so the scale already redefines what is happening. You don't just have one person here. Jim? Um, earlier you had said that of the, the um, open source uh, projects that are going on at Microsoft, the kind of the key question that you asked them to be involved in the project is, would you be willing to work with academics and researchers and so on? Mm -hmm. um, if if we were to, like, we, we're always looking for subjects to, you know, software subjects to study and offer recommendations, maybe try to find bugs, or like we were talking about sure. earlier, us recommend one of your developers who might, you know, fix a bug or something like that. What, how would the interaction work if, if one of these projects says, yes, we would be willing to work with academics? How, I mean, I, I would imagine it's different for different projects, but what would be some examples of how they might interact with us? Well, if you go to any of these pages, you immediately find out who they are. And then if you start using that project, your, your first line of contact is going to be, oh, I don't understand why it's doing this when it should be doing that. So you'll get a response um, immediately. And then you'll continue from there. And you become somebody that they might like to hear from. Uh, after that, once you are established as somebody who really is now knowledgeable and active, <coughs> use, uh, active user of this, uh, other kinds of interactions start up. Um, you can come and visit that person up at Microsoft. You can work more extensively. For example, Daphne. We had uh, people at Imperial College London who were using it extensively. 
and the professor from there came and visited us for um, uh, three months in order to include in Daphne stuff that she wanted in Daphne for her courses, which wasn't already in at that time. And so she worked with us on it. Um, and that was just simpler to do it uh, at Microsoft than far away. But it could have been done far away because it was open source. Yeah, and then her students were then, we gave them some grants after that uh, to continue working on the project. <coughs> So things grow organically, I think, uh, when you prove yourself as really interested. OK, with that, um, you, for those who may not have been here before, uh, the protocol that we do at this point is uh, we can, uh, as the audience, uh, go downstairs where there's a reception set up where you'll be able to uh, uh, talk one on one with Judith if you have questions or with others, but uh, please don't come up here now because we that's why we set up the reception downstairs. It's it's a purpose. It's a process. Hopefully you get what we're trying to do. But with that, first I'd like to uh, thank Judith again for. Uh, <laughs>